it's, it's the further consideration stage of the Executive Committee Functions Bill, and I call the Junior Minister, Gordon Lyons, to formally move the motion. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that the further consideration stage of the Executive Committee Functions Bill be agreed. Members will have a copy of the Marshall List of Amendments de detailing the order for consideration. The amendments have been grouped for debate in the provisional grouping of amendments selected list. There is a single group of amendments, amendments one to three, which deal with the ministerial decisions, and we will debate the amendments in that group. Once the group debate is completed, any further amendments will be formally uh, moved. If that is clear, we will proceed. We now come to the single group of amendments for debate. With Amendment 1, it will be convenient to debate Amendments 2 and 3. Members should note that Amendment 1 is a paving amendment to Amendments 2 and 3. In the interest of clarity, and as this type of amendment is not often encountered, I would remind members that this means that Amendment 1 is consequential to the other two amendments. But the question on it will be put before we consider the other two amendments. Members will wish to take this into consideration when deciding on whether Amendment 1 is made or not. Members will note that Amendment 3 is consequential to Amendment 2. I call Mr Doug Beatty to move Amendment 1 and to address the other amendments in the group. Mr Beatty. Chair, that's, uh, that's moved. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Executive Functions Bill, the Executive Committee Functions Bill uh, is a very short bill, um, but it's an extremely complex bill. Uh, and its main aim and the main tenet of that bill is to try and address um, what came out of the, the Buick um, judgment in regards to uh, the Department for uh, Infrastructure. Yet the bill has far-reaching issues that it also covers. And I'm no lawyer. And I don't have a team of lawyers standing behind me to give me advice. In fact, I left school at 16. I've got no educational qualifications whatsoever. But the reality is it is so complex and so far-reaching, which delves into how we govern Northern Ireland. The reality is it needs more scrutiny. And if at the end of this debate we are all sitting thinking that, well, that's wrong and I believe in this bit, but I don't believe in that and maybe this works, then the reality is there's a confusion within this assembly and therefore it is fair to ask for that scrutiny. So I'm going to say this, that we as an assembly got it wrong when we gave this accelerated passage. It could well be that this bill is fine and it will go through all of the scrutiny mechanisms and it would come out and we would all be satisfied. But because it's got accelerated passage, we are not going to have the ability to do that. And it's important that we scrutinize major changes to how we govern here in Northern Ireland. I guess at the time of the bill, uh, we were all focused elsewhere. Um, it was brought before the, um, uh, the, executive, office, the executive Office Committee on the, the 1st of July. Uh, I wasn't there. I was laying a wreath uh, at Belfast um, City Council for uh, some remembrance. Um, so I wasn't there to question. But I'm not even sure that, that I would have maybe even seen the issues that were in front of me then. Because our eyes were turned elsewhere. On the 1st of July, our eyes were turned with the issue that we're still dealing with, and that was Bobby Story's funeral. We were turned towards it. We were focused on COVID-19. And I genuinely believe that because of that, many of us, and I'm admitting fault here, including me, missed this. I made a mistake. Now, I'll be absolutely clear, there's others who didn't make mistakes. The Green Party certainly raised that issue. Uh, People Before Profit certainly raised that issue. Can I remind the member, this is not a debate about accelerated passage, but about your amendments. Absolutely, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, and I'm just trying to give it that bit of 
context to, 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 to where we are now, because I'm quite clear that I stood there and was not a vote against accelerated passage. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of laying out where we are in regards to that. So let me be clear here, if I'm really honest with you all, if I'm honest with this assembly now, I think this bill should have been paused. I think it should be paused and we should put it back into the system and go through the full scrutiny process again. That's what I think we should do. However, it's been moved and we're moving forward. And I don't want to see my amendments as being a record to this bill because there's things in this bill I think we now need to deal with. And those issues around the Department for Infrastructure, I think are fair wind. I think there is enough within the planning system that will give us scrutiny of the Department for Infrastructure. So my amendments have not touched, has not touched that in any shape or form. My amendments to the bill allows the passage of those particular issues in regards to the Department for Infrastructure to address Buick to go through. And that gives MLAs time and space to look at the other aspects and the other aspects which I am attempting to amend. So there are three amendments in total and the first amendment is a paving amendment uh, and I'm not going to address that, it's purely about the numbering uh, of the bill uh, and amendment nine is consequential to sub, uh, uh, amendment three uh, which is about subsection nine is consequential to amendment two which is about subsection eight and I'll read out subsection eight to you. Nothing in subsection three and this is in referring to three in the Northern Ireland Act 1998, requires a minister to have recourse to the executive committee in relation to any matter unless that matter affects the exercise of the statutory responsibility of one or more other ministers, more than incidentally. But if I go to section 19 and 20 um, of the Belfast Agreement, it clearly states... The Executive Committee will provide a forum for the discussion of agreement on issues which cut across the responsibilities of two or more ministers for prioritising the executive and legislative proposals for the recommending a common position where necessary. This is about cross-cutting issues, not necessarily immediately, but cross-cutting issues which may be down in the future, six months on, a year on, two years on, five years on, and therefore that subsection 8, in my mind, absolutely is in conflict with, se uh, with sections 19 and 20 of the Belfast Agreement and subsection 3 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. And you only need to read the explanatory notes. Uh, and and I, I apologise to the members that I'm picking and shuffling papers, um, but uh, there's an awful lot of complexity within this bill an awful lot of complexity. And that's the clear tenet of what I'm saying to us today. It is so complex, we need time to scrutinize it. But if I go to the explanatory notes and I go to section 10, referral to the executive committee must take place where a matter is significant and controversial and outside the scope of the program for government, approved by the assembly and in force, where no such program has been approved by the assembly and in force. There's another piece that goes with that which says a minister is not required to have recourse to the executive committee in relation to any matter unless that matter affects the statutory responsibility of one or more of ministers more than incidentally, which is straight from the bill itself. But if I think it conflicts with that, it certainly conflicts with the ministerial code. Because where it says Nothing in subsection 3 requires a minister to have recourse to the executive committee in relation to any matter unless that matter affects the exercise of the statutory responsibilities of one or more other ministers more than incidentally. Yet, the ministerial code lays out a whole list of things that must be looked at. And some of them are not cross-cutting. Some of them are pretty bland. Requires agreement on prioritisation. 
requires the adoption of a common position, has implications for the programme for government, is significant or controversial and is clearly outside the scope of the agreed programme referred to in paragraph 20 of Strand 1. Yeah, absolutely. I am grateful to the member for giving away. The member mentioned ministerial codes, which obviously apply to ministers. Given that this is executive business, how does he feel that he's supporting his own minister in the executive by moving these amendments today? Because obviously he would have had to give his assent for this item of business to be in front of us. Um, I thank the minister for, 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 for giving way. And um, if the, if the, uh, I thank the member for giving way. And if the member wants to to play the man instead of the ball, and you're more than happy to do so, and I'm happy to accept that. Uh, but the reality is, did he agree it? Did he agree this legislation, or did he agree there should be legislation? Well, that's a question for yourself, and you can raise it up. No. So did the ministers agree there should be legislation, or did they agree that it was going to be this legislation? We can contend one way or the other, but it still takes me back to the very start of what I said. If we are an assembly where we cannot stop and reanalyze a decision that we've made, we are lame ducks. Just a minute. I have, I have gone through my life looking at decisions that I've made, and as the situation changed, I've had to change my decisions. It's the right thing to do. It's the morally courageous thing to do. It's what I'm having to do here today. I'll give away. Way. Could you just clarify for us then, uh, and I accept the point that he's making in relation to his colleague, the Minister for Health. So, are we to take it that his uh, comments in the chamber today are the stated agreed comments of the Ulster Unionist Party, and those have been uh, discussed with the Health Minister, and therefore we have a situation where both the Health Minister and the Ulster Unionist Party and the comments that you make are all uh, in, in accordance and all in agreement? I, I, I thank um, the member for his intervention, and uh, you, you, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a very pointed question in the way you put it across, but it's a very pointed question. The answer is very pointedly yes. We are in agreement with this because we have analysed it, and we have decided that we have gone the wrong direction in regards to this bill. Only in subparagraph eight and, and nine. Um, and as the member uh, on the Executive Office Committee, the fault lies with me for not making sure that my members understood what is going on. So to me, that subsection 8 is in conflict with section 28 alpha of the Northern Act 1998, which outlines what the ministerial code should be. So at the end of this, the ministerial code is going to have to be changed to meet this bill because they are in conflict. Because some of the issues that have to be discussed at an executive may not be cross-cutting today, but might be in a year. They may not be controversial now, but they may be a little while down the road. And I'd have to say, and I'm in a position where I'm, 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 I'm full of opening myself up here to criticism, and, and I don't mind opening myself uh, up to criticism, because we did not support all elements of the St Andrews Agreement. But this is a good element of the St Andrews Agreement that we are now about to overturn. It is the main plank of the St Andrews Agreement, a main plank which was to stop ministers deliberately or not going on solo runs, to stop them deciding for themselves what they were going to do. And it's been well documented that the late Martin McGuinness, who got rid of the 11 plus pretty much on the last day before the assembly collapsed, and that could be viewed as going on a solo run. So this St Andrews agreement brokered by the DUP and brokered by Sinn Féin was a good piece of legislation, and we are looking for it to stay. Yes? I am grateful to the member for praising the content of the St Andrews Agreement. He's absolutely right. How then does that square with what his leader has consistently said about returning to the factory settings of 1998? Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I've made it clear. 
made it clear that um, I, I'm opening myself up for what could be viewed uh, as criticisms. But everybody will know that the issue that we have with the St Andrews Agreement is how we elect our first and deputy first ministers. That's the main issue. We can look, and look at things and say that's good, uh, and we can look at things and say that's not bad. It would be pretty awful of us, or any political party who just sits there and says every single thing is bad. We all have the ability to look at things and say, I could take that and I could take that, but I don't want that. We do it when we're buying a car. I'm sure we can do it with legislation. This bill, we believe, dilutes those safeguards that we got in St Andrews. Others can disagree. I, I get that. And we'll hear from others as they say they disagree. But I think it does dilute it. Since 2007, there have been few solo runs. I think there's been two, and both ended up in court, and both were brought back again because of what was agreed at St Andrews and is in legislation. That's an awful thing to have to go to court, one minister to another minister, to get them to roll back on a decision. If we put this bill through, I think we're going to see more of that. Because what minister wouldn't look for any loophole whatsoever so they can push forward what they need in regards to their ministry? It's natural to us all. But what was agreed at St Andrews holds them back on that. It holds us all back on that. It's an important safeguard as much for our society as it is for the minister himself. Because ministers themselves are not infallible. They can make decisions which can be wrong, but if it's being scrutinized in the executive, then they can have a sanity check done on that decision. I think it's a positive. And that is why I think we should get rid of subsection eight and subsection nine, which changes that. And it does change it no matter which way you look at it. There's also a question uh, of collective responsibility. There are many contentious issues out there that ministers are going to have to take. And what has been really, really important is that our executive have all stood together with those decisions. Collective responsibility. But we could now go down a road where a minister will be left on his own to make a decision. Even if he brings it to the executive for discussion, other ministers could turn around and say, yes, that's fine, but nothing to do with me, and I don't support it, and I can step out of this office. I can step out of this office and just attack you every single time you say something. The bill that we have before us here has raised the bar for cross-cutting issues. It's raised the bar at a time where we need more scrutiny it's giving less scrutiny. We're allowing this bill through without proper scrutiny. We have no idea the effects of this bill in the next five years. But at a time when the executive needs more scrutiny, we're putting a bill through that's giving less scrutiny. And scrutiny is a good thing. And some people say that because of the system we have now, our legislation is slow. And there's a fair argument to that. And we do want to speed up legislation. But it has to be good legislation. There's no point having speedy legislation if it's no good. If it's not future-proofed, it's not good legislation. And scrutiny helps to produce good legislation. So the system we have now is a good system to scrutinise and stop people going on solo runs. We have ministers at the minute who have already um, been reported to the Commissioner for standards in regards to their behaviour. We have the Executive Office Committee who's asked for legal advice to do an inquiry into the behaviour of ministers. People make mistakes. 
Yet this bill intends to give ministers more power. And that can be abused. And I don't want to see it abused. And I'm not talking about one party or the other party. I'm talking about all ministers. I do not want to see any minister abusing their power. And the way to stop them, either deliberately or accidentally abusing their power, is to have a scrutiny mechanism which is in the executive already and it can be found in the St Andrews Agreement. It's utter madness. But what if I'm wrong? What if I'm standing here and I see people whose eyes might be glazing over now because it's all very technical, it's all pretty boring, and I've already made my mind up anyway? And that's fine, because maybe I'm wrong. But if I am wrong, what's the rush? What's the rush? Yes, of course. Uh, former DUP men don't need loudspeakers, Mr. Speaker. I can assure you. But could I say, could I say that the reason why backbenchers are rolling their eyes this afternoon is not because they can't understand your speech or don't agree with it, but because they have been whipped to within an inch of their lives to vote for something that many of them are extremely unhappy with, but have been told they have to vote for it. Secondly, would he agree with me that nowhere in this debate has there been the slightest justification for the rush? Nowhere have we been told this must be agreed at the fag end of an assembly term. No one's explained why it can't wait until October to allow greater scrutiny. And no one has explained why I had to sit in that chair last Tuesday as temporary speaker and advise members that they had less than 24 hours in order to submit amendments. No one has explained any of that. So you've raised a very valid point, and I think it's incumbent upon the members, the ruthlessly whipped members of this House, to explain why there's a rush. Uh, I, I, I thank the member for his intervention. Uh, uh, and, and you've articulated very well the point that I, that I, was, that I was aiming to make, because uh, what is the rush? We have got time to look at this. We've been dealing with this issue since January, and nobody has felt the need to rush it in quickly in February, for example. We've let it go, and all of a sudden it's rushed in right in the middle of a pandemic, right in the middle of a crisis, where our first and deputy first minister won't even give an interview together at the minute. So we are rushing this through. And I would implore all members of this assembly, um, uh, and, and, I, and I look at members of this, this assembly, and I, and I think when they do their business here, they act absolutely honourably. That you must have moral courage on this issue. Moral courage. The hardest piece of courage you can ever have. Physical courage is easy. Moral courage is something which is extremely difficult. And it's what you apply it's about yourself. Apply moral courage. And if after all of these people have spoke, you have a doubt in the back of your mind, then that doubt in the back of your mind should be saying to you, let's delay for more scrutiny. Yeah. I just wish that he would be more consistent in his application of the issue of moral courage when he is supported in this House legislation which is immoral. And I refer to the protection of the unborn child. So we, we don't need lectures in this House about moral courage. But, but I have to say that we have an issue, and that issue is very simple. And that is, we have a dilemma, not for the first time, amongst lawyers, who, I have to say, are paid considerably more than the members of this House. And we could fill this chamber with lawyers who have been to the High Court, have been to the Supreme Court, have judgments, have judgments overturned, and now we have a, a litany of legislation which has been poured over by, uh, by legal counsel. And I think lay people, like most of us in this House, are wondering on what side of the legal argument is the practical outworkings of this piece of legislation. It's not a moral dilemma for me. It is more an issue of what is the legal advice 
that gives me and the members of my party the protection that no minister is going to run rogue and do things which none of us want. And of course, the party opposite are quite good at doing what they have done in the past with their mischievous activities. And I have to say, I for one want to ensure that all the members in this House and all the parties in this House abide by the rules and play by the rules. But sometimes we know, not only within the executive, we saw the antics of them a few weeks ago when they can't even behave themselves at a funeral. So why can, would you Can I remind the member that the intervention uh, should be brief? Yes. He may uh, wish to make a speech at some uh, point. Uh, well, I apologise, uh, <laughs> Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. I conclude with this. Would the member give some consideration to the issue in regards to the dilemma of the legal arguments in regards to this problem? Uh, the member, Mr Storey, raises a very valid point. There is conflicting legal advice on this, but the crucial legal advice comes from one of the architects of the St Andrews Agreement, Richard Bullock. And if there's doubt, and there clearly is, between those who think that this will stop solar runs and those who think it will facilitate it, then the obvious thing to do, if there's that doubt, is to postpone further consideration of this bill, to allow us all time to sit down with the conflicting legal advice and come to a conclusion, not to try and railroad something as important as this at the end of an assembly term with 24 hours notice for amendment. Um, uh, thank uh, both the members, um, uh, and uh, I accept a lot of what you're saying, uh, Mr. Story. Uh, and the debate about abortion, I guess, is, is for another day. But I accept your point for wholeheartedly, and uh, I, I hold no malice uh, in regards to that. And um, you, you're, you're right; there is conflicting legal uh, advice, um, and that is why I'm saying that we need to delay this process so we can scrutinise that conflicting legal advice. So MLAs would have the ability to speak to experts. MLAs would get legal advice, question not just the intentions of the bill, but the repercussions of the bill. Because we can all write a bill which has a wonderful aim, but it doesn't necessarily always end up that way. And that's why this one is so important that it is given the extra scrutiny. And I'll say this again, I'm not trying to wreck this bill. What I'm putting in is taking away those parts which give powers unfettered powers, and they are at times or could be to individual ministers. And I said earlier on, I can accept that some people want to speed up legislation. That is absolutely worthy, and, and, and I agree. But those people who want to speed up legislation normally want to speed up legislation they support, and the legislation they don't support, they're happy to keep in the long grass. Scrutiny stops that. Scrutiny allows it to be viewed and it allows it to be put out. And when it's put out, it's put out with a collective responsibility from an executive, our executive, our executive who makes rules. Trust is important within government. At times, we do not have trust. I sense it here. I feel it here. I have trust issues myself with many of political parties here. And I know that there's people look at me and they have trust issues with me. Again, uh, I accept that. Yet these safeguards in the Northern Isle Act 1998, as amended at St Andrews, help create safeguards where trust was not there. Therefore, it's pretty simple. The substantive part of the bill which deals with the Department for Infrastructure and the Minister for Infrastructure in order for her to make decisions can go through because planning does, although it has problems, planning does have its own safeguards. All I'm saying is that subparagraph 8 where it allows ministers to make decisions without bringing it to the executive should not go through should be taken out, revisited, and if necessary, brought forward at a later stage when it is given full scrutiny. It's a simple amendment. It can't be a difficult amendment to support unless there's an ulterior motive to force this through at short notice. And I'm hoping that there is not. Uh, therefore, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, 
I apologise for rambling a bit. I apologise for the, the paper shuffling. Um, this is a complex issue. I don't have all the answers. I am not a lawyer, but I would like to look at this in far more detail than what we've looked at it now. That is a fair ask. That is a fair ask to ask this Assembly to scrutinise this further. Sit down. Yes, sir. <laughs> Just to, to really follow on from the point of the, 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 member, the Honourable Member, uh, Mr Wales, the, the difficulty that I have in terms of the intervention of Richard Bullock, who is someone who I hold in the highest regard, is the difficulty is that Richard has been out of this place now for some considerable period of time. And, and, and I think that there, is, there are issues in terms of where the gaps may be in what has happened in the intervening period. The other point that I would make is in regards to this Assembly still has the 38-name petition in regards to recall. It still has the fact that three ministers of the executive can call any issue which is cross-cutting or controversial into the executive. So therefore, I think there's a sequence of events that still gives us uh, protection, and I think the junior ministers will be able to either confirm or deny that that is the case, knowing the fact that they know I'm not always across the detail in some of these things. But that's my understanding, and I do think that uh, we need to take that. And it's not a criticism of Mr. Bullock; it is someone, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, who I hold in the highest regard. But I think he falls into that category of lawyers and uh, people of legal minds. And when you have a group of lawyers in a room, you don't have agreement. Uh, you probably, in most cases, have disagreement and a very large invoice. <laughs> I, I, I thank the Minister for his intervention, and you caught me just as I was finishing, but, but I will just mention uh, a couple of points. First of all, Mr Bullock, I don't know him, never met him. Um, uh, but if he's bringing out something which makes us look and stop and take check, then, then it's worthwhile looking and stopping and taking check. You know, regardless of whether he's here before or, or after. And, and the same way, if Peter Robinson came out and said something, we would, we would look at it and say, well, here's a man who knows the system. Let's, let's listen to him. So, so let's not just discount people. Um, uh, as for the, the three-person uh, block, th there isn't one. That three-person is to force a vote in the executive. That's what it does. It forces a vote in the executive. But let's future-proof that. However, let's future-proof that. Let's future-proof that in five years when... Unionists or the DUP do not have a majority. What happens then? We have set in, 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 in motion a chain of events which could be worse off for us all. So let's not think one step ahead. Let's not think two steps ahead. We need to think three and four steps ahead. Let's not just think this is about one party abusing the system or another party abusing the system. Let's not even say that it's a deliberate abuse of the system. Sometimes it can be absolutely accidental where somebody brings in legislation or something where they do not know the repercussions of it in the years to come. So let's future proof. And for me, now, right now, as I stand here, the St Andrews Agreement future proofs how we operate in the executive. And if we're going to change that, we need to change that with more scrutiny than what we've given it now. Uh, and I commend my amendments. Mr Speaker. I call Christopher Stelford. Thank you, uh, sir. And before I turn to my remarks, could I thank those members of the House who were in touch with me because I wasn't, um, I wasn't well last week and it was uh, very much appreciated. I want to say to Mr Beatty that I hold him in no malice either. I will always afford to any person that serves our country in uniform the highest respect uh, and honour but I have to politely disagree with about 95% of what he has just said. Um, as I say, there's no uh, particular malice. I think it was big of the person who's moving these amendments to say that he got it wrong. I think he went too far when he said that the Executive Office Committee got it wrong. Um, Mr Beattie, from his perspective, might have missed the pass, but as a member of that committee, I'm satisfied that I exercised my function, my scrutiny function of this legislation to the best of my ability. And I think that other members of that committee would say likewise, including uh, the chairman. It is important that we all try to provide as much clarity as possible, particularly and regrettably 
due to some confusion in the discussion of this bill on social media and in newspapers over the last few days. And I think we should examine the timeline of events because it's not particularly difficult to join the dots and see how we got to this point. To be fair to Ms Woods, Mr Allister and people before profit, they opposed accelerated passage, voted against it. Fine, I have no problem with that. I think that's principled and consistent. What happened was we had the committee consideration where uh, FM and DFM came in and briefed us and answered questions on the content of this bill. Then, I thank for giving way, but, but can we just make sure that's in the record? That scrutiny at the committee it lasted 11 minutes. It's a three clause bill, one of which is the two, I think one of which is the title. So, you know, um, so we had the committee meeting. Then I think we had the vote in this House. Then an article appears in a newspaper. Then suddenly this has grave constitutional implications and we should all be panicking about the content of it. Something appears on Twitter and suddenly the Assembly is debating amendments to a bill. I think people can join the dots. Yes, I'm happy to. First of all, it was a, an in-depth article in a leading newspaper, which was then followed up by another in-depth article in a leading newspaper. But the question is not the fact that it appeared on Twitter. It's the name of the person's account that it appeared on. Does he accept that Richard Bullock was absolutely instrumental in the St Andrews Agreement discussions? That he was a leading advisor to the DUP for something like 17 years? He has one of the finest legal minds in Northern Ireland. And that wasn't just his legal opinion, but also two and solicitors also have grave concerns with this. And all I think any reasonable person is asking is that there is a degree of doubt. There is a degree of doubt about this. And even he seems to indicate that he has some doubt. If there's any degree of doubt, then surely the sensible thing to do, and the issue he hasn't addressed is, why not park this for several months? Where's the rush? Look, Richard Bullock's a dear friend of mine. Richard Bullock was a guest at my wedding. So I would never, uh, I am never, I'm never going to be tempted into publicly criticizing a friend. And Richard is my friend. So I think the member's in danger of turning what is a legal argument into something of a psychodrama. And I don't think that that's helpful. What I would say is that my understanding is that the executive office has received legal advice from the Departmental Solicitor's Office, the former Attorney General, and um, another source. I, I can't recall the third source of legal advice. You know yourself, the member knows himself, that where you get one or two lawyers together, they can argue a black crow is white until the day is done. There is conflicting legal advice. And as I say, Richard's my friend, and the member will not tempt me into saying anything that could be construed in any way as criticism of a friend. Yes? And I would never want him, and I'm sure nobody who's worked with Richard Bullock would say anything against his professional advice, his legal integrity. But he has made the crucial comment. He, say, he has told the House there is conflicting legal advice. Now, is he prepared to accept backbenchers being whipped to vote for something when there's that confusion, given the importance of the issues involved? He still hasn't answered my question. Why do we need to make a final decision on this today? Why can we not reflect on that conflicting advice and come back in October? About 50 words into my prepared comments, <laughs> and I've given way to him, I think, three times, or certainly twice. If the member bears with me and is a bit more patient, uh, I may persuade him to the benefits of this bill, although having known the member since I was about 14, I doubt that I will persuade him uh, when he has his mind made up on an issue. Um, it's a value that he passed on to myself, and I, I obviously I respect him for that.
The St Andrews Agreement marked a very significant achievement in addressing many of the deficiencies that existed in the Belfast Agreement, particularly around the issues of accountability and the operation of the Executive Committee. Our party is proud of what we achieved in the St Andrews Agreement and the outworking of that agreement in enforcing an enhanced sense of collective responsibility in the Executive. Reference was made uh, by Mr Beatty to the previous solo runs by ministers before St Andrews, particularly the decision of the then Education Minister, the late Mr Martin McGuinness, in relation to the transfer test, widely known as the 11 plus. Let me be very clear. Under St Andrews and under this bill today, such a decision could not be made by a minister on a solo run. It is simply not true to say that it could. We pushed hard to have this issue addressed at St Andrews, and we will fully maintain the protections which prevent government ministers from doing such a thing without the agreement of executive colleagues. Any suggestion that this bill would diminish this is a fundamental misunderstanding of the bill which we have been considering. It is inaccurate of those who have attempted to suggest otherwise. There is a certain irony that these amendments have been brought forward by a member of the Ulster Unionist Party, whose leader has stated numerous times that the party position is to reset to the factory settings of the Belfast Agreement. Does the member realise that to do so would remove all the protections of St Andrews and would in fact facilitate precisely the type of solo runs such as happened with the 11 plus? This is ironic and it demonstrates a remarkable lack of awareness by the Ulster Unionist Party. The amendment today focuses on two sorry, focuses on the cross-cutting test. All ministers are required to bring matters which are significant or controversial or cross-cutting to the Executive Committee for consideration and agreement. This remains the case with this Bill. It was reported in a newspaper that the amendments before the Assembly today should remove, sorry, would remove the clause that would mean that significant or controversial matters would only be required to come to the Executive if they satisfy a test of being more than incidentally cross-cutting. This is an error, and it's a misunderstanding of the Bill. The clause referenced in the amendments has nothing to do with the requirement to bring cross-cutting or significant matters to the Executive. Indeed, that test is strong and stands alone as a requirement upon government ministers. Not only is this requirement maintained, it is enhanced by clarifying in the legislation that if there is no programme for government in place, then all matters that are significant or controversial must still be referred to the Executive Committee. This definitively settles a matter which has been the subject of back and forth in the courts for many, many years. This supports and, in fact, enhances the concept of collective executive responsibility. And this brings me then on to the detail of the specific amendments which aim to remove the clarification in law as to what the term cross-cutting means. I find this again a rather bizarre move for a party which is part of the executive. We have heard previously that the clear and unambiguous advice from legal advisers to the executive that the implications arising from the Buick judgment would mean a fundamental change in relation to the range of issues required to come in front of the executive committee as cross-cutting. This would mean that the vast majority of departmental decisions, including in the Department of Health, would now need to come before the executive. Any issue simply touching on a ministerial or departmental interest, even if it's just incidental, would now need to come before the executive rather than allow a minister to make the decision. Why bother appointing ministers? if we expect them to operate in that way. The only answer to this appears to be that ministers individually and the executive collectively should accept a very wide interpretation 
of the requirement, but just continue to ignore it by custom and practice. What a bizarre legal principle that would be. One, in fact, that doesn't exist, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This is nonsensical. I would refer, Mr. Beatty, to the original Hansard exchanges during the passage of the Northern Ireland St. Andrews Agreement Act. It is specifically referred to, sorry, it's specifically referred to exchanges, and they were pre notified by the then uh, Member of Parliament for East Belfast, uh, Mr. Peter Robinson. And what do those pre notified questions and answers delivered in the House of Commons tell us? Well, firstly, they tell us that the term interests is not referenced, nor, by the way, is it in the Belfast Agreement or the St Andrews Agreement. Rather, it's clear that at all times the reference is to responsibilities of departments rather than interests. It is made absolutely clear that if a matter is cross-cutting or significant or controversial, that the minister doesn't have the authority to make such a decision. It must come to the executive committee for a decision. Therefore, the proposal to continue and just ignore the requirements. Thanks very much. <laughs> Therefore, the proposal to continue and just ignore the requirements to bring the matter to the executive by custom and practice has no legal basis, and would subject all such decisions to successful legal challenge. It is recognised, thirdly, that there are matters which are de minimis, incidental, on the cross-cutting grounds that would not need to come to the executive for consideration or agreement. So how do we find ourselves at this point, at this point today? There are a number of reasons. Firstly, the response seeking clarity on what would be considered de minimis or incidental was not forthcoming, either in the ministerial response in the House of Commons, nor definitively in the ministerial code. This is, on one hand, understandable. Any attempt to be overly prescriptive could well give rise to greater issues. This is a challenge we must still face on amending the ministerial code. However, the biggest challenge came from the language used in the original drafting. The terms were lifted from a negotiated political document. But the term cross-cutting is not legislative language. This has given rise to the debate on this matter in the courts over the course of the last 14 years since the St Andrews Agreement. What has happened, though, up to the point of Buick, is that the practical application of this test has been applied by the executive and by ministers. This balance aims to find a sensible solution to ensure that all important decisions come in front of the executive committee, without meaning that all departmental decisions must also be brought before the executive. This will always be a judgment call. But we have heard clearly during the passage of this bill that this amendment reflects, as best as possible, the approach consistently taken to this requirement. Member is uh, about to finish the text that he was given to read to the Assembly today by one of the special advisers. And what he hasn't addressed as he comes to the conclusion of his remarks is why we have to make a final decision on this today and tomorrow. Why, given the doubt that he accepts exists, we can't set aside a bit of time for cool reflection and come back to this in October? And if I'm wrong, and if Mr Biddy's wrong, well then we'll say so when we've had an opportunity to consider his views, the legal opinion that he has received, which of course we won't see because it's, uh, it's private to the executive, and the views of all those others who are concerned about this. Why the haste? And he hasn't given a reason why on the 27th of July we have to rush this through. This House voted to give it accelerated passage. That's how an accelerated passage bill works. To be clear, all those types of matters that were deemed to be required to go to the executive prior to the Buick case will continue to be required to go. This means no change at all. Rather, it prevents the situation from changing to bring in many more issues. It's also important to note 
that even with this amendment, while read in conjunction with the Buick case, it is still likely that not only at least as many matters will go, but that additional matters will also be required to go when applying the test. These are matters that will need to be set out in the revised ministerial code. In conclusion, sir, I'm saddened by the confusion caused and by the commentary around it. The bill is a short one, but one which does deal with a very specific area of the law. One thing we know is that lawyers will always disagree with each other. However, the duty then falls on us to interrogate the matter, to be informed and to come to a reasonable conclusion. If others elected not to do so at various junctures that were available to them, that is a matter for them. I will be voting against these amendments today, supporting a sensible way forward that fully respects and enhances the principle and the intention of St Andrews. Thank you. I call Pat Sheehan. I'll ask John Corley. And, um, I suppose prior to the Buick judgment, uh, everyone here believed that if an issue was uh, significant, controversial, or genuinely cross-cutting, that it would be called then to the executive for decision-making. The Buick judgment, of course, changed all that. And uh, any issue which uh, another minister even had uh, an incidental or peripheral interest then had to be called in to the executive. And the rationale behind this uh, bill here today is to ensure that the legislation is recalibrated back to where we all believed it was prior to the Buick judgment. Um, so, for example, if we moved ahead in the context of Buick, uh, practically every single decision made by a minister would have to go into the executive. Uh, the argument has been made previously that uh, the finance minister uh, has an interest in practically every decision made because he's the one who resources it. Uh, and that's not genuinely cross-cutting, as we all know. Uh, but if, for example, the uh, health minister decided to bring forward legislation in regard to mental health in prisons. It's inconceivable that he, that, that would not be cross-cutting with the Justice Department. Uh, and that's an issue which is genuinely cross-cutting. So I suppose at the crux of the discussions here today uh, is the issue of accelerated passage uh, and uh, why we should have uh, rushed this uh, particular bill through. And uh, if you consider that uh, since the Assembly got back up and running, we have dealt with uh, numerous pieces of legislation that received no scrutiny whatsoever in terms of the pandemic, uh, the crisis, the emergency that we find ourselves in uh, at the present time. And while none of us would, under normal circumstances, support that type of draconian legislation, we all understand that it is necessary. And for those reasons, we have acquiesced to that type of legislation passing through this assembly. In terms of the crisis, we're still in a crisis. We're in a health crisis, but there's also an economic crisis and emergency. And we need to deal with that as well. It's not just a, a matter of the health crisis. We need to get our economy back up and running. Uh, and the way we do that is, first of all, by dealing with the health crisis, by trying to eliminate the coronavirus from our society, and ensure that our economy can open up again uh, and, and move ahead. Now, one of the most important uh, cornerstones of our economy uh, is infrastructure, and particularly major infrastructure projects. I mean, uh, the uh, infrastructure, minister, uh, infrastructure minister's entry is probably overflowing at the minute with a number of major infrastructure projects which need approved. Uh, 
And the planning process is already uh, a two-tiered system. We have the councils and we have the department. And to add another layer of bureaucracy to a planning would, uh, in my view, only uh, increase bureaucracy, slow down the process, and make it much more difficult at a time when we want to. Is the, the members looking at intervention? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, and I have to say I'm, I'm intrigued by the members opposite who seem to be able very, good, very well to try and hit some public opinion. They, they come into this house today wearing masks, and some of the same members weren't that good at wearing masks whenever they attended the funeral of Bobby Story. So I think, it's, I think there's a, a fair degree of uh, populism goes on in, uh, across that side of the chamber. But he talks about the economy and about s slowing up the economy. The Members' Party was, had no difficulty slowing up the interconnector, which gave us an all-Ireland uh, electricity provision, and they still don't accept that that is the way forward. Yet it's all-Ireland, yet it's uh, a process that they're quite happy to go to the courts in relation to. Really, when are we going to have an end of double standards and a bit of honesty in terms of what it is really the party opposite does want? And I thank the member for his intervention. Uh, <laughs> I always uh, am amazed that uh, the member opposite, when he intervenes on issues of propriety in government, um, I think, given the long record of his own, government, his own party and, and government here, uh, the, the terms neck and brass come to mind. But we we'll leave that for another time. Certainly. Go ahead. I, I've always been big enough to uh, stand in a position where I will uh, defend, and I'm very proud of being a member of this party and have been since I was 15. Order, order, when, members, when was... order, order members, can I bring you back to the bill and the amendments rather than your private discussion which is going on here? On an issue of cross-cutting and is of cross-cutting importance. Could the member give any example when I was a minister, of which I was responsible for, where I did any of the things that he's making allegations in relation to? Well, I'll thank the member for his uh, intervention again. I'm not sure what relevance it has to the debate, and uh, uh, I didn't keep a note of all the decisions the, the member made when he was a, a minister. So, we'll, uh, and I, I'm not sure what relation it has to this particular debate, but we'll, we can discuss that outside the chamber if the member wishes. <laughs> In any event, as I was saying, we need to get the economy up and running. Uh, we need to get people in the construction industry uh, back at work again. And one of the best ways to do that is to get big infrastructure uh, projects moving along. Uh, we don't want any further delays. Um, under normal circumstances, uh, accelerated passage isn't the best idea. However, in the circumstances we find ourselves in, in this current emergency, there's a crisis there. We need to deal with it. We need to deal with the health crisis and the crisis in the economy. And this is a sensible and pragmatic way forward. And for that reason, uh, uh, I'll ask Kian Corla, I'll be supporting this bill and opposing the amendments. Gormagut. I call Colin McGrath. Mr Deputy Speaker, and the uh, SDLP has supported this bill after its journey through the executive, where we're quite confident that it received all party support, um, including the party that is offering the amendments today. Um, that journey will have uh, seen substantial legal scrutiny, legal opinion and interrogation before making the recommendations that are in the bill. And we have sought far and wide internally within our party from our membership, which includes um, many who were architects of key agreements and policy documents uh, to seek their opinions on this bill. Now, we do have an imperfect system of government here, and that's a legacy of the troubles and division that our community has faced over the generations. The system we have of numerous parties coming together to make decisions has often led to paralysis in decision making. It can allow one larger party in the executive to block decisions that everyone else wants to see, and that paralysis has severely impacted at times the ability for ministers to take decisions. 
As a representative of a smaller party in the executive, it is somewhat frustrating that there was an expectation that every decision go to the executive in order to receive approval or otherwise it was open to judicial review. This bill rectifies that and goes some way to codifying what needs to and what doesn't need to go to the executive. Now, I acknowledge that while it isn't a perfect bill and it's been done by accelerated passage, which no one likes, uh, the speed is being used to unlock many of the key planning decisions that will get our economy working again. If I must, yes. Thank you for that very generous offer. Um, what Mr Beattie is proposing doesn't stop those projects going ahead. It doesn't stop major infrastructure being implemented. But what it does, it closes a loophole which could lead to solar runs on many more significant issues. I thank the member for his intervention and I know that he wants longer time to debate this bill and I think that he's using interventions to get that time but like the member opposite for South Belfast if he gives me some more time to actually make my remarks he will see that I address the concerns that he has made. Uh, maybe Mr Deputy Speaker it hasn't been made clear but there is no limit on time when one is dealing with legislation. member who was speaking is simply talking about the timing of his discussion and making his points, but I'll, I'll let him explain the member's point is on the record. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Speaker, as I say, I acknowledge that while this isn't a perfect bill and that it's been done by accelerated passage, which no one likes, the speed is being used to unlock many key planning decisions that will get our economy working again. It will speed up the delivery of jobs, it will speed up decisions, and it will prevent the paralysis that we have seen People want action and delivery from Stormont and from the executive, not a government that will constantly block the decisions that are needed to get the North working again. The Buick decision has cast a shadow over the capacity for the executive to make decisions. It has left some unanswered questions about what ministers can and can't do. There are a number of assurances that we would seek that reduce the necessity for these amendments, and I would ask for ministers for the Minister's understanding of what constitutes significant and controversial, as the provision for such matters to be referred to the Executive remains unchanged. And while I appreciate that these are not codified in law, there are conventions that apply, and I would appreciate your view, Minister, on how these can continue to be brought to the Executive table. One issue that uh, would be in concern for me is that of Brexit. Uh, which we know is significant and controversial. And I hope that the Minister would agree with me that any decision that a Minister takes in relation to Brexit uh, should be brought to the Executive for consensus. Yep, sure. Would the Member agree with me that implementation of the Ireland Protocol is uh, an oblig a legal obligation on the whole Northern Ireland Executive, therefore the implementation and delivery of that protocol is inherently cross-cutting? Absolutely, I would agree with that and, and would like to see all uh, decisions that are taken in light of that are brought to the full executive for discussion. And as well, I mean, there was an executive subcommittee uh, on Brexit and it remains now a standing agenda item and that only underscores to me that it is a significant and controversial issue. The proposed removal of sections 8 and 9, I feel, would not be helpful. These sections provide the legal surety that ministers need to be able to take a decision. And while people might disagree with the decision or the content or outworkings of it, these sections merely provide the certainty for the minister that the decision can be taken. And there are and remain many avenues uh, to challenge ministerial decisions. And not least, there is this place, which is quite often uh, overlooked whenever it comes to decisions. We have plenaries, ministerial questions, ministerial statements, scrutiny committees, private members' business, and other methods to challenge the decisions that a minister will take. And this yes, of course. The, mem the member's touching on a point that I, I raised in my own comments. Um, the member agree with me. It is, it's frankly insulting to the other members of the Executive Office Committee and to members of this House to suggest 
we were all too busy looking at COVID, or we were all too busy in the fury over the, the funeral uh, recently, that we just ignored this or let, or let this slip. We're paid to make sure that it doesn't slip. So it's insulting when a member stands up and says that other members of other parties were simply asleep and let this go through uh, unnoticed. Well, I, I accept the point that he makes, and of course what I would say is that a scrutiny committee is an opportunity not to scrutinise for the sake of it. It's if you've got questions, but if you're satisfied with the decision that is being presented, then you don't need to seek those questions. You've already maybe had conversations uh, with party members. You may have had other conversations to determine that you are happy uh, with the decision that is being presented, and therefore you do not need to uh, scrutinise for the sake of scrutinising. Um, but as I said, we have this uh, place, and uh, this place is critical too, for example, members of the Green Party, uh, People Before Profit, Jim Allister, and indeed, or more increasingly, uh, Mr Wales. Um, they are not at the executive table, and they do a fine job of holding ministers to account for the decisions that they take. We also have the Human Rights Commission, the Equality Commission, commissioners for young people, older people, who provide over appropriate oversight to the decisions that are taken by the executive. And also matters that are and attract significant spend or hefty changes to internal departmental budget lines are required to be brought to the executive as well. And then there is also the ultimate decision-making body, and that is electors who will get to judge whether a minister and their decision was right or wrong. Constantly being able to... Yes, go on ahead. Yep. Uh, member agree with me on his last point that the electors will get the opportunity to, at a very late stage, uh, exercise their displeasure with a decision that is made in this chamber. And would the member then agree with me that if this bill passes today, we cannot undo the damage that may be caused? Uh, and, but by backing the amendments today, we give ourselves that shorter uh, window of time to make sure that we get it right first time. Given the fact that we have three parties in this chamber who sit in that executive who can't agree on the purpose of their debate, they may vote the same way. But that lack of confidence which led to a three-year hiatus of this chamber is the risk that is being fought out today in this discussion. The member for his intervention, and I, I suppose, well, again, it overlooks the fact that as a party we're happy with the bill. We don't need to take any longer or any further considerations of it, and that is a, a viewpoint that we are, are perfectly entitled to hold. Uh, but constantly being able to threaten and use a judicial review because a matter wasn't brought to the executive, even if it wasn't significant or controversial, is wrong, and sections eight and nine close down this vexatious process. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe that the amendments proposed today are well-intentioned uh, and are brought as a helpful measure to ensure accountability, but it is our belief that there remain an acceptable number of methods to appropriately challenge decision-making at the Executive, and we support the Bill as it is presented. Thank you. I call Andrew Muir. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, my party will not be supporting the amendments uh, before us today, and I'll uh, outline why. I understand the rationale given for today's amendments is, would be that the provisions proposed in the legislation that these uh, amendments seek to remove will give too much power for a minister to act individually on what has uh, been described previously as solo runs. Uh, I will seek to address these issues before coming to a final point regarding how the clauses in question would interact with the requirements for the Ministerial Code. The Northern Ireland Executive is rightly criticised by members of this Assembly and the general public at large for not getting things done quickly enough. In the Alliance Party, we want Ministers to be able to take decisions that are clearly within their sole statutory responsibilities. However, we must also recognise that in a post-conflict society such as ours, collective decision-making on difficult issues is important. An executive that does not come together to collaboratively and genuinely resolve significant and controversial issues will not last long. Under the current system, ministers have a duty to work through these matters together. The alternative is bitter recrimination, a breakdown of relationships and trust, and ultimately the fall of our democratic institutions. The requirement to bring significant or controversial matters to the Executive Committee sets a high bar. The language was inserted in the legislation following the St Andrews Agreement, and the provisions in question under this legislation do not change that. Introducing the more than incidentally provision into statute does not in any way remove the requirement to bring significant or controversial matters before the Executive Committee. 
On that basis, claims that the amendment is necessary to prevent solar runs are, in my opinion, overplayed. Mr Deputy Speaker, concerns whether legal challenges are more substantive. I fully accept that, that whether a decision is more than incidentally uh, cross-cutting is difficult to precisely define. Yes. Thank you. Member, uh, for giving way, the member accept that if a decision is deemed to be significant, controversial or cross-cutting in law, that decision cannot, cannot be validly made by a minister. And if a minister announces a decision, that decision has no force because it has to be brought to the executive by virtue of the fact that it's deemed significant or cross-cutting. Thank the member for his intervention. And the issue is, is that we've had a number of cases which have uh, judged or ruled on that. And uh, Mr Allister, when we were considering the second, state, second reading of this bill, did outline that the incidentally thing is something that will be potentially tested in the courts. Uh, and th these issues have been tested before, uh, and reference has been made to the St Andrews Agreement and the provisions and the protections around that. The, the, the Act, which you know, implemented the St Andrews Agreement, makes it clear that it is around significant and controversial matters, which are clearly outside the scope of the agreed programme referred to in paragraph 20 of Strand 1 of the agreement. The cross-cutting elements, which uh, other people have been referred to, is not within the St Andrews Agreement. It was within the basis of the agreement, which is Strand 1, Democratic Institutions in Northern Ireland, Clause 19, the Executive Committee will provide a forum for the discussion of and the agreement on issues which are cut across the responsibilities of two or, other, two or more ministers for prioritising executive and legislative proposals and for recommending a common position where necessary. It's in the, the Belfast or other people, the Good Friday Agreement is within that. What this legislation seeks to address is to give clarity on what cross-cutting is in light of the Buick judgment. Uh, and the significant and controversial elements within the St Andrews Agreement remain. Additionally, the question before us today is whether the situation would be better if we actually remove the sections of the uh, legislation as the amendment proposes. I do not believe that it will, Mr Deputy Speaker, for the simple reason that following the Court of Appeals ruling on Buick, many decisions by a minister not brought before the Executive Committee could be challenged on the grounds that it was cross-cutting. This could make it difficult for ministers to get anything done, even on matters that are not considered significant or controversial. And on that basis, I cannot support the amendments. We have to resolve the issues arising from Buick, not to run away from them. Buick and the judgments given around that is something I've read over for the last week, and I would other, encourage other members to read it. We have to act on the uh, outcome of Buick, and to say that we're going to put it off and leave it to October or beyond is irresponsible. We have to have a system of government in Northern Ireland where ministers can make decisions and that where matters were significant and controversial are then referred to the executive and there's clarity given on what cross-cutting is. One highly significant point we do, however, need clarity from the executive office is how the proposed legislation will interact with the requirements of the ministerial code. The Ministerial Code also includes a requirement for ministers to bring cross-cutting matters to the Executive Committee, but there are no caveats regarding what is considered incidental as proposed in the legislation. On that basis, unless the provisions of the Northern Ireland Act is considered to be senior to the text of the Ministerial Code, clarity needs to be given as whether the Ministerial Code needs to be updated and legislation brought before this place. I would ask a junior minister in his response to clarify that. In closing, in essence, this, these amendments proposed to remove the clauses on cross-cutting on the basis that legislation is brought forward at a later date and not through accelerated passage, as is likely to produce better law on this issue. It is not clear to me that that is likely to be the case. And furthermore, it would come at the cost of curtailing the power of ministers to take decisions for the additional months that it would take to pass this legislation. On that basis, Mr Deputy Speaker, I oppose the amendments. I call Jim Wells. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I have listened with interest to the comments made by Mr Stolford and no doubt uh, Mr Lands will also read a script given to him by an adviser. I know that there is deep concern on the DUP backbenches about this legislation. I am very aware of the concerns of many. But I'm also aware of the system and how it works. 
uh, those who think outside the box, those who have concerns, will be brought in and educated, and they will be drilled, uh, frog marched, or stampeded through the lobbies to vote for something that they know in their heart of hearts they can't support. And what has not happened in this debate, and no one has told me, why we are in this position. We are the 27th of July. This issue, the Buick judgment, has been with us for a long period. There was ample opportunity to address this issue, and it wasn't taken. So the, the, the legislation was expedited through this chamber. And I asked Mr. Storford why the rush, and he said because we adopted emergency procedures. That's not the answer. Why did you adopt the emergency procedures? Why did you have to rush this through? And uh, uh, the chairman of the uh, OFM DFM committee said that it's important that we get major planning applications uh, processed as quickly as possible. Will any of those applications be processed between now and October? Absolutely not. For various reasons. First of all, try getting a planner on the phone at the moment during coronavirus. Try and get anything decided at the moment with coronavirus. So therefore, there's not a huge stack of applications waiting there to be processed. But there is one, and I have received many emails from people from West Tyrone. Indeed, many of them would be voters of Mr McGrath's party who are deeply concerned that this legislation will be used to force through the Dalriada gold mining application. There's huge opposition to that in West Truro. Now, I understand it's been referred to a public inquiry, but after that report, it's still the minister's decision. It's the minister's decision whether that goes ahead or not. And there are a lot of people who are concerned in West Truro about this and who feel concerned that this has suddenly emerged out of absolutely nowhere. There's been 24 days between the publication of this legislation and to today's debate. That is insufficient time to deal with such a controversial piece of legislation. Secondly, I sat uh, in the Speaker's chair last Tuesday, and in my duties being totally impartial, I was asked to inform members that uh, amendments to this crucial piece of legislation had to be in at half nine the following morning. Now, that's a very, very unusual procedure. At least Mr. Beatty was wide awake and was able to dash to the business office and get his amendments in. You do not give less than 24 hours notice for this type of legislation. And the question I have to ask is, why the rush? Why has this debate been held at the very end of an assembly term? And why was there, I think, an attempt to quietly push this through without public scrutiny? Now, in the middle of all this, Mr Bullock uh, made his comments, and they weren't Twitter messages, Mr Stalford. They weren't. They were well thought out, well argued pieces in a leading local newspaper, the newsletter. And he forensically went through the bill line by line, and he made what I thought was a, a very, very well argue, argued case that this bill should be put on hold on a temporary basis. Of course, there was, and he also raised, by the way, the fact that, in his opinion, the idea that three ministers and the executive can stop anything was a fallacy. It doesn't exist. He made that argument. The response from the first minister was, well, we're going ahead anyhow. Didn't really deal with his concerns. And then there was a comment uh, from the two solicitors, who also raised important uh, points about it. Mr Alistair QC, who is not, unfortunately can't be with us today, raised very valid concerns. And I noticed a former leading member from South Pole Fast was in the, in the newspapers at the end of last week raising his concerns. So many people have said, hold on here a minute. This legislation is not all that it seems. So what are we asking for? Are we asking for the bill to be ditched? No. Are we asking it to be shredded? No. What we're asking for, and I know many DUP backbenchers want this to happen, Many of them want it set aside for a few weeks to allow an in-depth analysis of the critiques of the bill that have been made by people who are much better educated than I am, and even better educated than Mr. Stolford, and that's saying something. They have all looked at it with a forensic legal mind, and they have all come back to say, hold on here, 
there's something amiss. Now, remember this. If this bill becomes legislation, we are stuck with it forever. There is no way, there's no turning back. After tomorrow, we have this bill for the rest of our political careers because one thing's absolutely certain, that those who have stood up this afternoon with such a great enthusiasm and read the scripts that their spads have given them and have stood up and said they're in support of it, they will never, ever allow it to be amended or changed in the future. So we're going over, we're going over a cliff here at the moment and there is no way back. And the point that hasn't been raised, it doesn't matter what Mr. Bullock thinks. It doesn't matter which well-educated people like Mr. Stolford or Mr. Lands think. It's what a judge will think when he is ruling, or she, glad to say at the moment, or she will make of it when it's, this issue is certainly it. Will. I, I would never impugn the member's integrity, and I'm sure when he was a minister, he never would have read a, a prepared script from anyone. I'm sure that would never have happened. But would he accept that it is entirely because we have had a legal judgment that these measures are necessary. It arises out of a legal judgment. I accept that. Uh, what I can say, Mr Stolford, is, and he admitted it, he says there is confusion. Mr Stolford said there is confusion, there is debate, and there is a lack of clarity on the implications of this bill. And does he accept from me that once we go past tomorrow, it doesn't matter how much confusion or vagueness there is. It's a done deal. It'll get the Queen's assent, and we are stuck with the implications of this bill. And is it, if it turns out, as I expect and others expect, and it allows ministers from this side of the House to go on solo runs on projects which would never, ever have the support of my community, well, then those who have marched through those lobbies today in support of it will have a, a very difficult question to ask, answer to their electorate. That's the, that's the point I'm making. But if, just to go back to the, the earlier point, it doesn't matter what Mr Bullock, Mr Stolford, Mr Alistair, anybody thinks. The question is, how will a judge interpret the powers of ministers if this issue is sent to judicial review? Now, if there's the slightest doubt in my mind that a judge could rule on a minister doing a solo run, then my advice to this House is to pull back quickly because you could be going over this cliff which, and a situation which never can be recovered. So we're not, asking, we're not giving the minister, Mr Lands, a ladder to climb down on. We're not asking him to eat humble pie and seek forgiveness. We're just saying, give us a bit more time on this. Give us the th two or three months we all need. And Mr Biddy's right. I'm, I was slept in on this. I'm the first to accept. Until I read the critiques of this bill, I wasn't aware of its implications. I sat meekly and allowed uh, expedited passage to go through. I didn't raise any concerns. But when it becomes that a large body of very professional legal advice says, hold on here, there's a doubt, then it's incumbent upon us when there's no need, absolutely no need for this to be rushed through, to sit down with cool heads and examine it. Now, if it transpires when we've all had a chance to do that, that in fact our concerns are wrong, they're mis misplaced, well, I'd be the first to stand up and say, yes, I was wrong. But at the moment, I am not in a place and a position to say whether it's right to go ahead with this bill or it's not. And it's too important. It's not like a dog fouling bill or a litter picking bill. It is too important to let it go through to a situation which can never be redeemed when there's that doubt in our mind. And Mr. Stolford has admitted there is that level of doubt. Remember, Certainly he will. The member would if he reflects on what I said, what I actually said was because of certain media outlets and social media, doubt had been sown in people's minds. That's a different, that's a different matter altogether. I tell you, doubt has been sown in this obscure backbencher's mind, I can assure you. I am extremely worried. And can I say, going by the phone calls I've had over this last two or three days, there's a lot of people in his party have exactly the same concern. And I'm getting the texts and the emails as I sit here saying, we are desperately concerned as to what the party is doing on this subject. Now, let's go back to St Andrews. Now, I chaired the Programme for Government Committee, which led to St Andrews. It was a long period of discussions with the parties. Uh, the then speaker, Mrs. Bell, decided not to chair them, so it was myself and Mr. Donnelly chaired those discussions for months and months. 
Our reward was that <laughs> we didn't get invited to St Andrews. But anyhow, so St An <laughs> I'm not bitter. But anyhow, what I would say is that you know, that was our reward for all our hard work. But anyhow, as a result of those discussions, as a result of those discussions, St Andrews occurred. And then there was a series of public meetings held, which I attended. And the main issue that sold St Andrews to the vast majority of the unionist electorate was we always have the ace card up our sleeves that we can block anything that a Sinn Féin minister, would, they never mentioned the SDLP, I don't know why, but a Sinn Féin minister would do which would be to the detriment of our community. That agreement would never have had the support of unionism had it not been for that crucial undertaking. There was also an undertaking, by the way, that Manfredi coalition would only last for eight years. Well, unfortunately, we're still stuck with a totally unworkable system. Now, if we had been told that there was any doubt about that lock, as it were, on the activities, our block on the activities of Sinn Féin ministers, I don't think it would ever have got through. I don't think we'd have had devolution in 2007. But we accepted the commitment that was given and so far has worked. And legal, legal action has shown that uh, we were right on that. Now, let's move to Mr Bullock. Now, for some members, younger members of this assembly, the name Richard Bullock doesn't mean very much. I accept that. But I had the privilege of working alongside Richard for 20 years. In the DUP, when some backbencher decided to look at all the facts and make up his own mind, he was taken in for a quiet bit of re-education. And it was a good cop, bad cop situation. I am not going to name the bad cop, but I think people may know who he is. But I will name the good cop, and the good cop was Richard. And whilst one might take the sort of the Schwarzenegger approach to re-education and uh, make it very clear that one's life wouldn't be worth living unless one changed one's mind, Richard was a diplomat. Richard was a gentleman. And the reason why so many backbenchers respected the views of Richard Bullock was they knew he had a legal brain second to none in Northern Ireland. They knew he could be trusted in his understanding of very complex and detailed legislation. And therefore... Uh, is this a, a debate on amendments uh, to the bill that there is, or is it a discussion about Richard Bullock? Because I'm losing uh, which it is, because the majority of the conversation today has been about Richard Bullock rather than the bill or its amendments. So. I would encourage the member to connect the two if he wishes to just, uh, link that. Uh, uh, and bring back to the amendments and views on it. Deputy Speaker, on this occasion, I think we can connect Mr Bullock's integrity and knowledge with this debate because we would not be having this debate now if it wasn't for the intervention of Mr Bullock and other legal experts. Certainly. That is the point. I, I, I do appreciate that the member's integrity and him and I go back a long, long way. Does he not accept the point that there is an eminent member who normally sits on that seat beside him, uh, who has two letters after his name, and who's not here in this house today. But he has made uh, uh, comments on legal issues, but they're opinions. Because let's remember, no one of the judges or the legal profession have divine knowledge. So we always need to caveat that it is an opinion, of which there are three, two solicitors and Richard. But there are equally other legal opinions which are saying, no, the outworking of this is not as is envisaged by the other three or four, whatever the number may be. But I, I, I just would ask or caution my colleague and friend to take that into account. Richard is someone of immense ability, but it is an opinion. And there are other decisions that were made in the past 17 years that, as a humble backbencher, I didn't agree with. And there are consequences we're not in the best interests of this House or the, the community out there. Take, for example, the number of members in this chamber. So I think that we all can point to issues where no one is infallible. We've all made our mistakes. We all can get it wrong. And if he would caveat his, his comments in that, term, uh, in that way, I think some of us would accept some of his other arguments with a more ready hand. The difficulty is, Mr Storey, if you are wrong, and we go past the point of no return tomorrow, it be, could be calamitous 
for the future governments of Northern Ireland. If Mr Bullock is right and the other legal opinions are right, and we have the temerity to ask and receive a two-month delay on a final decision on this to enable uh, further scrutiny, and it transpires they are wrong, what is there to lose by doing that? What would another eight or 12 weeks do to destroy or undermine this bill? What it would do, it would mean that at the end of that period, we could all stand up and say, we've considered the issue carefully and we can give this bill our total support. But at the minute, there is still a doubt in my mind. And the issue is too important to vote for if there is that shred of doubt, because the implications are absolutely enormous as far as the future of Northern Ireland is concerned. Because it would only take, uh, for instance, let's say, take Casement Park, for instance. Now, Casement Park's a planning decision, but say Sinn Féin, as they could with the Department of Communities, decide to spend a vast amount of money to make uh, Casement Park even grander. That would cause huge concern amongst the unionist community, given the sectarian Republican nature of GAA. Now, could we do anything to stop that? No, we couldn't, if Richard Bullock, myself, Jim Alistair, etc., are right. What will be the reaction of... Certainly. The member appears to think that uh, you simply submit an application for planning and it goes directly to the minister. The reason why Casement Park hasn't, that project hasn't advanced is because local residents used the existing planning processes in place to prevent it from taking place because of the way they had been uh, badly handled, badly treated, to be quite honest, by the applicants in that, in that instance. I was making it, wasn't <clears throat> And I appreciate you letting me in on the point of order. Um, it's just on the comments made by Jim Wells that the GA is a sectarian organisation. I would urge him to immediately retract those comments because you know, the GEA could, could not be anything further from that. And it's, you know, quite sad that he would label any sport and organisation, particularly one re so rooted and relevant in the community as the GEA, as a sectarian organisation. Um, I would ask members to use tempered language in all that they say in this chamber. The members made their point and it's on the record. Call Jim Wells. It's the organisation that holds Great Escape events in South Down, events eulogising Bobby Sands and one of its leading lights was hur hurling sectarian abuse at a lawyer's prudence in, in Newcastle last September. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's this type of intemperate language that in the past has led to the killing of members of the GAA and uh, I would ask you to insist that the member desists from this type of uh, intemperate language. Gormagut. Member, we're here today to discuss uh, an important bill and the amendments to it. I would urge everyone to return to that subject rather than uh, raise other issues which is, are causing discontent. I ask everyone to use tempered language in, in the points that they make and to return to this bill and to the amendments and to this legislation. Mr Wells. I'll make no further comments about the GAA, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Let's give another example. A proposal to move uh, departments from Coleraine University to McGee. That would cause huge concern to the community in Coleraine. A Sinn Féin minister, should he happen to be holding the, the uh, portfolio, could do that. And my interpretation of the legislation is that there's nothing that can be done if this bill goes through to stop that because it clearly is within his or her power and it does not meet the criteria under the legislation to be stopped. Sir. I, I think the member needs to be very careful of hyping an issue which is not relevant. The powers in relation to the governance and courses at any university doesn't rest with any minister. They rest with the university. So I think that the member needs to be aware of what the powers, because if that was the case, I would be knocking on the door of the economy minister in relation to certain courses that have disappeared in the past. The responsibility rests with the university, not with the minister. But the, the honourable member, he's very long standing, and I've known him for about 50 years. The honourable member misses my point. You could have a situation where McGee University are very pleased to have courses transferred from Corey into McGee, and you could have a compliant minister who will allocate the appropriate funding. 
Now, there could be huge concern in East Londonderry and North Antrim constituencies about that. And my reading of the legislation that's going before us is that cannot be stopped. Now, that's a totally hypothetical example. I was going down the route of the GAA, and that obviously caused offence to the members to the right. So I'm plucking that out of the air as, a, as another example. Or it could be pensions for those who've been involved in terrorist activity. It could be anything. But the point is, what we do know is that when Mark McGuinness was about to leave the post, the late Mark McGuinness was about to leave his post as education minister, he unilaterally abolished the 11 plus. And the reason why we adopted St Andrews was to make absolutely certain that that didn't happen again. And people might say, but it hasn't happened since. Well, it hasn't happened because there are many obnoxious proposals emanating from the members to my right, which would, if they had half a chance, they would implement, but they don't bother because they know under the present proceedings they, it's not worth their while because they will be blocked. Now, anything that weakens that worries me intensely. And I will, will ask Mr. Lyons to explain, and this is the Achilles heel of this argument, what would be wrong if today we agreed not to move proceedings, not to move the legislation any further, and bring it back in October. You could be in favour of the legislation, you could be against the legislation. There is nothing, I believe, requires the urgency that this is being pushed through. And the more that members stand up, member certainly. Uh, if the member is suggesting that delaying a decision on the grounds of not having the full information and not understanding the impacts and how it would impact people right across Northern Ireland. Can you remind me how you voted on our motion for an extension to the Brexit process? Order members, I don't want to have a debate about Brexit. This is not a debating chamber about Brexit or previous decisions. This is a debate about the bill that is before us and the amendments that are proposed. Can we concentrate that on that please? Mr. Wells. I think the fundamental difference is there had been months and months of debate on Brexit. Every jot and tickle, every minutiae minutia of every piece of legislation and policy had been debated. The difference here is we've had 24 days and less than two hours scrutiny in its entirety. That, I think, is the, cruci the crucial difference. And I, the one point I get more and more suspicious about this legislation, when backbenchers are ordered to stand up and support its rapid uh, transfer, its rapid passage through this chamber. That makes me more worried because I have to think, is there a hidden agenda here to get this through in the nod? And the fact that they decided to table it when they knew that people's attention were in coronavirus, many members were, had holidays planned, we had the whole Mr. Story funeral issue. Maybe it was an interesting time to get bad legislation passed without public scrutiny. I am really, really quite worried about it. And what I know is that my view is held by many, many unionists throughout Northern Ireland. Many. And therefore, I'm appealing to Mr. Lands, simply agree to an extension of the scrutiny of this legislation so that we can all agree with it or otherwise with a clear conscience, knowing that we've done everything to check and double check that what we're being told is correct. I call Rachel Woods. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I suppose I'll have to mention Mr Bullock's name here today, like every other member has, but with the caveat that I or the Green Party have not spoken to him or engaged with him on this matter at all, although that I am glad that his comments on whatever platform they were made has encouraged other members in this House to realise the issues within this bill and that this bill is not just about planning and there are wider implications included here. Junior Minister Lyons, in introducing this bill to the House on the 6th of July, stated that the bill is intended to address the implications for ministerial and executive decision-making of the judgments of what is known as the Buick case, which was brought against the Department for Infrastructure to grant planning permission for a waste incinerator during the time that this assembly was suspended. It is supposed to limit the grounds by which legal challenge can be taken against a decision made by the executive or individual ministers and outline the processes by which planning decisions can be taken for the Minister of Infrastructure. It's also to amend the Northern Ireland Act to deal with any significant or controversial matters that are clearly outside the scope of the programme for government. That is, of course, if we ever have one. It leads to scenarios where any minister can decide matters without recourse to the executive unless it affects the statutory responsibilities of another department more than incidentally. And the grouped amendments here today are supposed to limit the proposed changes to purely planning matters by removing the reference to other ministers. 
But do they do that? We have had no time to consider the full implications of this bill, or indeed the amendments here today could have. And the Executive Committee spent only minutes discussing this on the 1st of July, which is hardly enough given the implications and the reality that this is a change to the Northern Ireland Act and the St Andrews Agreement. The bill was and is being sold as a minor technical bill to regularise an anomaly identified by the Buick case and to stop the executive becoming a de facto planning making decision body for planning applications. So why then was the bill not limited to just planning? The fact that the amendments have been tabled shows that the bill as it stands appear to be much more significant than we were being told by the executive office and we need time to properly consider it. There is absolutely no justification for accelerated passage. So whilst I understand the rationale behind the amendments that have been submitted and that we're debating today, i.e. to try and remove the reference to other ministers, it is still for me opening up the same question on what this means for the exercising of power and decisions by the executive going forward. They do seem to remove some of the main problems identified, but leave the specifics to do with planning. So does this mean that the Department and Minister for Infrastructure will be exempt and enjoy the increased power and authority? Do the amendments, if accepted and passed, mean the Infrastructure Minister may take decisions on their own on those matters, but not anyone else? And how would this fit in with the collective responsibility of the Executive, even if this bill was passed amended? How will this fit in with our wider responsibilities over the environment, which is not confined to one department? And planning decisions will, of course, have more than one incidental, significant or controversial impact on other departments and ministers' responsibilities. You could and can make the argument that every planning decision of this, kind, of this impact uh, will have an impact on the environment. So where does this leave us? We should be encouraging better collective and collaborative working, not giving departments cover to plough ahead, working in silos or isolating one through these amendments, recognising that there are issues with the way in which this bill is written and the powers that it confers on our ministers and departments. This is not the time to be passing powers uh, in this bill. We need a full and informed comprehensive debate with assembly scrutiny and I have heard no reasons given by any other members from both sides of this chamber and in this house today that accelerated passage has been required for this. If it was needed it would have been introduced in February and this is example of a bad government and bad policy will flow from it. And I call Jerry Carl. Mr Temporary, uh, Deputy Speaker, um, it's not an overstatement um, to say that the vast majority of the public question the already uh, levels of transparency, scrutiny and oversight in this Assembly. And indeed, when I first spoke on this bill, I outlined my disgust at the cavalier way in which executive, uh, the executive circumvents the basic tests of scrutiny and accountability around decision uh, making the most reasonable people should expect from political leaders. I add to that my disappointment at how executive ministers brush off the concerns I have raised about the lack of accountability, presuming they are unlikely to face any consequences. If this bill is a past, it would undoubtedly further dilute the already low levels of transparency and accountability. I think it is reasonable to consider at this time the ways in which this executive and previous executives made up of the same big parties have flouted transparency and accountability in order that we know exactly the well-trodden path that this bill walks. The RHI scheme costs over £550 million pounds, and years on we find ourselves asking where is the accountability, where are the emergency oversight measures which would guarantee that this would never happen again and this bill would do the exact opposite. Decisions and statements in the middle of a global health pandemic at best mislead the public over PPE, an issue of unmatched importance for thousands of frontline staff? Where are the new beefed up oversight measures to guarantee that won't happen again? And this bill seeks to remove what limited oversight measures we have already. A massive decision, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, was taken over an incinerator, which would have an impact on communities and the environment without the Assembly in place, without a minister in place, and without the necessary oversight. A court and a court of appeal rightly upheld a verdict that this floats basic scrutiny. And what is the reaction of this executive? To take what most people would have seen as a sensible response to prevent permanent secretaries being allowed to make similar decisions in future, but use it as a vehicle to remove the same scrutiny measures from ministers so they can ram home similar decisions whenever they want without facing the scrutiny and questioning of the executive committee. 
I feel that sense of disgust again here today. And, uh, one of my own constituency I uh, cannot help but think about is the issue of Casement Park and those who must be rubbing their hands um, together at the prospect of pushing ahead with that project more or less unchanged despite serious safety concerns uh, raised by residents because they will have, in effect, less loopholes to jump through and less reason to hear the valid concerns of residents in the area. It is, of course, the, the case that occasionally a minister could choose to apply the same level of scrutiny for what are deemed controversial cases, but given the record of this and previous executives, who can truly say we would trust them to do so? And despite the various platitudes about learning the lessons from RHI, this bill does the complete opposite and draws the incorrect conclusions. The RHI scheme was world famous for all the wrong reasons. And what minister here wants to face a similar situation in the future? And if they can justify it, what is it uh, they have to hide from scrutiny, which is worth uh, this attack on oversight measures? Minister's decisions, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, should not be questioned only behind closed doors or by those who walk the corridors of Stormont. There, should be, there shouldn't be such contempt held for a public hearing, uh, public scrutiny and those who vote MLAs into this chamber themselves. The last few months that we have sat in this reformed, uh, seemingly reformed assembly, there have only been a handful of times in which the executive parties have openly voted against each other. So who can really have confidence in a behind-closed-doors approach to decision-making uh, from those same parties? Despite the well-trodden charade for cameras on either side of the communal divide in this chamber, this is uh, one of many issues that both of the big parties have each other's backs on. This isn't an issue, as is being presented by some in the media, which divides the main nationalist and unionist blocks. They are both here seemingly voting for it today, and it's not difficult to see how they could both benefit uh, in, in the future. To be frank, Mr Deputy Speaker, we and People Before Profit don't care about the political ideology or communal identity of the minister involved. All ministers should be subject to maximum scrutiny and accountability, and this bill seeks to do the exact opposite. And let's be frank, we can never rule out uh, I scratch your back if you scratch my back approach to decision making in this place. Any, any minister worth their salt would recognise the public's distrust because of the history of this place and be more than happy to face the necessary scrutiny measures in order to quell it. This bill does the opposite at breakneck and accelerated speed and using accelerated passage. It speaks volumes about what we can expect in the outworkings uh, of this bill. Where was the accelerated action? to ensure our health care workers are paid the strike pay uh, they lost out earlier this year. They have been promised it's coming, but I'm afraid they're still waiting on it for months. In summary, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Northern Ireland Act states that the Executive Committee should provide, in relation to both significant and controversial decisions, I quote, a forum for the discussion of an agreement on issues which cut across the responsibilities of two or more ministers. Who could truly argue against that? I would argue, in fact, that we should go further. Therefore, I will not support uh, this bill. And while I recognise the efforts of, of Mr Beatty to amend uh, aspects of it and, and to address some of the concerns raised, uh, I am not convinced the amendments before us do go far enough to fundamentally address those concerns, and I, I fortunately cannot uh, support them today. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, because this has been an accelerated passage uh, uh, approach taken, it has been rammed through very quickly, I think it is important to read on the record some concerns raised by others. Mr uh, Lucas, we mentioned the detail, but some uh, groups that have raised concerns about this uh, are the cooper co cooperation against men in, in OMBA group. They have said, and I, and I quote, it is clearly evident that the NI executive intends to imminently push through a selection of unsavoury and toxic projects, hence the justification for proposing this legislation at an unprecedented speed. This is the antithesis of democracy, essentially creating ministerial dictatorships, and many would probably agree with that. And they also say the purpose of this legislation seems to be to stifle debate, prevent any form of information relating to any proposed controversial project to be discussed in a public forum while suppressing all documentation relating to the same. So there are many, many concerns, not just raised by myself, Mr Deputy Speaker, and others in this chamber, by groups outside this chamber. So uh, I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. I now call on the Junior Minister, Gordon Lyons, to respond to the debate. Respond. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And we wish to oppose the amendments that were tabled by the member for uh, Upper Ban. Uh, the amendments that were tabled by uh, Mr Beattie reflect the concerns 
aired recently on, uh, on social media and in the media about what are the perceived impl implications of the bill for safeguards in the decision-making process and the authority of the executive. We believe that these concerns are unfounded. I can assure members that we have been rigorous in our consideration of these matters and have received legal support and advice from our senior legal advisers to the executive and to departments. We have rigorously examined the bill against our intended policy and also to avoid any unintended consequences. In doing so, we have looked fully at the intention behind the proposals in the St Andrews Agreement and the debate which clearly outlined the intentions behind the clauses in a series of pre-notified questions by the then MP for East Belfast, the Right Honourable Peter Robinson, to the Minister responsible for bringing the Northern Ireland St Andrews Agreement Act 2006 through the House of Commons, the Right Honourable David Hanson, the then Minister of State for Northern Ireland. And we are fully satisfied that the amendments in relation to clarifying the cross-cutting test are fully in line with those intentions as set out. Indeed, it is clear that the intention was a wide one, but it was one that cut across responsibilities rather than interests, and in a way that was more than de minimis. The language that we have used in this bill enshrines this test to ensure all matters which are more than merely incidental are required to be brought to the Executive Committee. The Belfast Agreement states in paragraph 19 that the Executive Committee will provide a forum for the discussion of and agreement on issues which cut across the responsibilities of two or more ministers. This was given statutory force by section 20 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. The agreement also states that ministers will have full executive authority in their respective areas of responsibility within the programme for government. I'll give away on that point. Yeah. Grateful to the junior minister for giving way. Would you clarify just in that, um, on the point about cross-cutting, presumably it would be his understanding and the executive office's understanding, um, and certainly I think my particular interest is that the implementation of the Ireland Protocol, which is binding on the entire executive, would be seen as such a fundamental cross-cutting matter that implementation of that and decisions around that would, if necessary, be brought to the full executive? Well, that, of course, is, is an agreement, is an issue that is being brought to the executive. And, of course, we have our um, Brexit um, subgroup within uh, the executive that is dealing with all uh, Brexit-related uh, matters. Um, but just uh, on, on a very important point, it should be noted here that the responsibilities and authorities of ministers are entirely based on statute. And the St Andrews Agreement and Act subsequently further codified these respective rules through the 2007 Statutory Ministerial Code, which placed specific obligations on ministers to bring cross-cutting and significant or controversial matters to the Executive Committee for decision. It did not, however, redefine or offer any interpretation of what constituted a cross-cutting matter. This and the need for referral to the executive was always left in the first instance to the judgment of individual ministers based on advice as to how and the extent to which their proposals impacted on the responsibilities of other ministers. It has always been the case, therefore, that ministers have been able to take a wide variety of decisions without reference to the executive. Before the Buick judgments, for example, planning application decisions were not brought to the executive for consideration. The executive is therefore not now abandoning a control it has never sought to exercise, despite what has been claimed. I will give way to Mr Muir. In the Buick judgment, it references that no previous environment minister or infrastructure minister has ever referred an individual plan application to the executive committee for agreement prior to its determination. Well, I, thank, I thank Mr Muir for um, his intervention. That's certainly my understanding uh, as well. This was, this was never um, a common practice uh, before. Um, so here we are, 14 years further on from St Andrews, uh, and we believe that the Buick judgments in their interpretation of cross-cutting as including matters which include 
uh, as including matters which another minister may have an interest in rather than one uh, which cuts across his or her responsibilities has shifted the balance too far in the direction of the executive by merging the concepts of ministerial responsibilities and ministerial interests. The threat of legal action against ministerial decisions, because a link, however tenuous, could be identified with the interests of another minister, would potentially make their exercise of their authority uncertain and the work of the executive unsustainable by forcing everything onto its agenda. In this regard, I wonder what consultation the member has carried out um, in moving the amendments with his party colleague, who is currently at the Minister uh, for Health. And he did ask the question earlier on, uh, did the Minister of Health actually uh, support um, this legislation, or did he simply support the idea of having some legislation? Well, I would say that that would be a fairly ridiculous position for the Minister of Health to put himself in, to say, right, go ahead, yep, I'm, I'm, I'm happy enough with the idea that we're going to have um, some legislation, but, but don't bring it back for me to see. Now, of course, the Minister um, has seen this legislation and has agreed to that legislation, and of course, um, every Minister must accept the decisions of the Executive uh, Committee under uh, the pledge of office. So what, what consultation has the member carried out with the Minister uh, for Health, because the consequence of removing this clause uh, within the bill would mean that he would have to bring almost every departmental health decision to the executive, based on the very broad interpretation that all matters uh, merely touching, uh, I'll ju uh, just in a second, um, that the very broad interpretation that matters merely touching on another department ought to be brought uh, as per the book judgment. Mr. Wells. Here, Mr. Lyons, Mr. Uh, Junior Minister, because we're, we're not asking for any of that. We're just, and you haven't addressed the issue. Why the rush? You haven't quoted any outstanding legal challenges based on the Buick judgment. You haven't indicated any crucial infrastructure project that we must get a decision on very quickly if we don't pass this legislation. Are you going to address the fundamental point that I think the one thing that the House can agree on today? is a few extra weeks to consider this may dot all the i's and stroke all the t's and avert potential disaster mr deputy speaker there seems to be confusion because um i think what mr Beatty is saying is that we um pass his amendment today pass the bill tomorrow and then we can look at these issues at another time however mr wells then seems to be saying well, look, we need to put a pause <laughs> on all of, all of this for, for a few months so i don't think that there's agreement here um even among the members who are supporting uh, these amendments as, as to what route it is uh, they want to go down. But to go back to the point that I was making, it's difficult to think of a... I'll give away, of course. More, more windmills, Mr Lyons, because you haven't answered the question. What would be wrong in giving two more months' consideration of this bill to iron out all the uncertainties that are so obvious inherent within it? timing um, of, and, and the member has raised before, the, the, the notice period for amendments and, and all the rest of it. That, that's sort of obviously um, a, a matter that, that is out of our hands at this moment in time. We have the, the, the next stage uh, of this bill that is, that is coming up tomorrow. Now, I understand there may be uncertainty uh, that some members have in relation to this bill, um, but we have gone through the accelerated passage uh, process, and I am convinced, based on the, the legal advice that we have received, uh, from numerous legal sources that this bill does exactly what it is that we want it to do. Now, I understand and fully accept that other members uh, may not believe that that is the case, um, that they don't have that assurance that this bill does uh, what it intends to do, but we have that confidence. The House has made the decision to proceed with accelerated passage, and that's what we're going to do. And on, on that point, I'll give way to Mr. Bailey. Thank you, Minister, for giving way. Uh, and you say about this legal uh, advice that you've got, which, which um, makes you absolutely clear. Will you release this legal advice so I can see it, so I can be absolutely clear, so everybody else can be absolutely clear? Because that would help. And if you'd done that earlier, maybe we wouldn't even be having this debate. So the question to the Minister is, will you release that legal advice? Sir, or the, the member should know that it's not in my gift um, to release legal advice that's given to the, to the executive. And I think the smile on Mr Beatty's face knows that that is the case and knows that that's not something that I, that, that I, that I am, am able to, to do. 
I am being very generous uh, with, my, with my interventions, and, 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 and I will give way to Christopher, though, though I note I note in the earlier comments that he said that um, people who were good friends of his uh, went to his wedding. That's how, how close he was with this one. I will put on record that, that I was not at Mr. Stolford's wedding. However, I will, of course, give, give way to him. I'm to say maybe the next one, but no, I don't think so. Um, the um, member asks about <coughs> seeking legal advice. Can the minister confirm absolutely nothing to prevent the leader or the members of the Ulster Unionist Party from making an appointment going to the departmental solicitor's office and asking for advice. I certainly wouldn't tell what other members uh, in this House uh, what to do, but if that is a path that they would like to go down, I'm sure that that is a path uh, that, that is open to them. So going back to this issue, for example, within the Department of Health, it's hard to think of a single um, issue within the Department of Health that would not meet the very low bar um, that has been brought about as a result uh, of Buick. And the argument put forward by some um, that the very wide and expansionist interpretation as a result of Buick should remain, um, as it would if this amendment uh, were to be passed, um, but that ministers individually or the executive collectively should just ignore the requirement uh, that it comes to the executive. Well, that, 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 that's just not sustainable. That can't continue. It's Of course it will, yeah. I'll not hold the junior minister too long. Um, would, the, would the junior minister not agree with me that uh, to make a change as proposed is to forget the political reality that we operate in? This is not a this is not a politic. No, it's not politics of unicorns and fairies. We have have a, a very disruptive and very disrupted uh, term of politics, not, none less in this last four to five years. And there's a piece of work to be done which is underpinned by. A new decade, new approach, and that perhaps this may be a, just a step too far in terms of those confidence and, and, and the relationships that need to be built. So what is it that the member is saying? The member is saying that we should do one of, one of two things. We should either bring all of these issues to the executive, everything that touches upon um, the, however ten, um, tenuous the, the interests of other ministers, we should bring them all to the executive. Or the other thing that the member is saying that we should do is well, let's just ignore that and only use the power uh, whenever we want to. Well, we can't do that. Uh, that's not sustainable. That's not a position uh, that we can uh, remain in. And because if, if something is required to be brought to the executive, then the minister cannot make that decision uh, by him or herself. It must come uh, to the executive. And then you're, you're, you're leaving yourself up uh, to all sorts of legal challenges. And that's why we're trying to bring in uh, the legislation that is before us uh, today. So, what changes as a result of this bill uh, becoming law? First of all, though, what, what doesn't change? Well, a minister must still bring a significant or controversial matter to the executive where it is outside the scope of the programme for government. And, se and secondly, cross-cutting matters uh, must still be brought to the executive. What does change, first, is that the Minister for Infrastructure does not have to bring the specified planning decisions to the executive nor can those decisions be called in by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Secondly, the intention of the St Andrews Agreement is enshrined, that significant and controversial matters are required to come to the Executive, and this is the, the key point, regardless of whether or not a programme for government is in place. And this addresses a long-standing uh, issue within the original drafting. And in relation to the requirements under the Programme for Government, the intention was that matters previously agreed by the Executive would not need to come again uh, to the Executive. However, this would only apply to the matters or aspects of that matter explicitly specified and included in the Programme for Government. So to reassure, any policy or matter not specified but which would or could support outcomes within the PFG will still require full consultation and would be subject to the requirement to come to the executive if it is either significant or controversial or if it is cross-cutting. Thirdly, and most relevant to today's debate, is that the test for a matter being cross-cutting has been given a statutory definition so as to reduce the uncertainty around what might constitute the interest of another minister by providing that a minister does not have to bring a matter to the executive unless it affects the exercise of the statutory responsibilities of another minister or ministers more than incidentally. The, I'm, going to, I'm going to make some progress. I'll come back to the, the member later on. 
That definition is also consistent with the language of both paragraph 19 of the Belfast Agreement and, importantly, the St Andrews Agreement and subsequent Northern Ireland St Andrews Agreement Act 2006, which refers to responsibilities and not to interests. It is important that an appropriate balance of authority and the efficient functioning of our system is struck. Now, this will not open the floodgates of unfettered decision-making by ministers on matters which would they, that they would normally have brought to the executive. Indeed, I can be very clear that the policy intention of the executive on this bill is to enshrine in law the practice that was in place before the case of Buick and after the St Andrews Agreement. The objective of the executive is that all matters that were deemed to be required to come to the executive prior to the Buick case and this legislation and all the types of matters brought to the executive would continue to be brought under these requirements. This amendment is not to diminish this executive role in any way with the exception of planning matters as specified in the amendment. This bill is intended to prevent a wide range of additional matters, not hitherto considered matters required to come to the executive from now having to be brought. However, it should be noted that the amendment relating to cross-cutting requirements read in conjunction with the Buick case still supports a wide-ranging responsibility on ministers in relation to matters that cut across the responsibilities of more than one minister. Indeed, that may still require additional matters to come to the executive than what had have been the previous practice. And further guidance on this will be given in the ministerial code. Therefore, it is in fact not only that the, it is not only the case um, that these amendments from Mr. Beattie uh, diminish um, collective um, uh, sorry, uh, let, me, let, me, let me start that again. It, it is not the fact that what we're bringing to the uh, executive, uh, to the assembly, they diminish executive collective decision making, but it protects and enhances it in all matters, with the exception of the planning related issue. In this regard, it is important to reference that cross cutting powers remain wide, as outlined clearly by legal advice. Once a matter is required to come to the executive, then the relevant minister does not have the authority to make that decision. In terms of the court's interpretation of this test and the practice of the executive committee, if a minister is in any doubt then that that matter should be brought to the executive uh, committee, uh, it, it needs to come. And this is the best way to ensure that legal risk is minimized. And these matters will be made clear within the ministerial code. Now, turning for a moment on the specific planning aspects of the bill, some commentary has raised the issue of multiple related consents that may rest in other departments. It's important to note that these matters were not previously brought to the executive, nor is there an intention that they would now be required to be brought. The ministerial code will require amendment, and this issue will be dealt with in a more detailed way within the code to make this clear. And if any problems persist in relation to this matter around planning, further action will be taken to address it. And let me address the issue, because there has been some confusion around call-in powers and how these relate to the planning section. In this regard, the call-in on these matters will still apply under Section 28B of the Northern Ireland Act, under the powers of 30 members of the Assembly to request that a matter is referred to the executive. We should also bear in mind that the call-in power for the First and Deputy First Minister in respect of significant or controversial matters is unaffected, uh, other than those in respect of those specified planning decisions. The amendment proposed today seeks to remove an important provision, and if agreed, would leave ministers in a position of considerable uncertainty as to the exercise of authority within their departments and will expose them to a much greater risk of legal challenge based on the interpretation of what is or is not a cross-cutting matter. And therefore, we ask members to reject the amendment. 
<coughs> I now call Steve Aiken to wind up the debate on the amendments. Uh, thank you very much indeed, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much indeed for everybody who has come in for this debate as well. And uh, it comes as no surprise that I am coming to support the amendments. Um, Let us quickly go back slightly through the history of this. And I think I will bring in a few of the catch-alls that everybody has been commenting as we have been going through here, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, this, the Buick case, and I declare an interest here as an MLA for South Antrim, I do not want to see the ARC 21 Ponzi scheme being built on the top of a cliff face in South Antrim. I do not believe that any of the decisions around ARC 21 have been correct. The Buick case was a long-running process that exposed the problems based around the planning decisions that were going forward. I fully understand the infrastructure minister, minister's frustrations about trying to get decisions going. I fully understand everybody else is here that we want to get the Northern, Northern Ireland economy going. I fully understand that the planning processes in Northern Ireland are, to put it mildly, archaic and are really counterproductive to trying to get Northern Ireland going. So the legislation that needed to come through to be able to make the infrastructure minister to make those decisions is something that we as a party, as indeed all the parties here in the Assembly, would want to see happen. But this a legislation as it came through, if it is not amended, is not that piece of legislation. And the question is pointed out by uh, Mr Wells, has been pointed out even in sort of oblique ways by Mr Stolford and by others here, is what was that legislation supposedly trying to do? What is the rush to bring this legislation through where it is quite clearly that there is a degree of doubt in the process as we are coming through? And you have heard speaker after speaker on this talk about the fact that we should take some more time to consider it. We have, turked, we have heard quite clearly from sort of the, uh, the junior minister, and thank you very much indeed for your comments, about the importance of legal, uh, the legal position and the fact that you have had the best legal advice. But I, look, members of the Assembly, they had the best legal advice when we were dealing with RHI, and where did that come to? So when somebody says to me we have the best legal advice and in some way we as members of the Assembly should accept this because this is some form of good legislation. The reason why we are putting in this amendment because it is not good legislation. It does not seek to set out what we tried to write, which was the problems with planning, with infrastructure, with Buick. It does something fundamentally different. And it's something that many people have alluded to from the comments that you've heard today as we've come through. But some of the specific points I just wanted to talk about as well is, you know, the question, is this good legislation? And the mere fact that a member of the executive a party that is part of the executive is challenging the legislative process shows that this is not good legislation. Why do we not think this is good legislation? Because one of the biggest problems we have in Northern Ireland is responsibility and accountability and openness and transparency. And I welcome the talk about the ministerial code, which hasn't been updated yet. I welcome the fact that we're going to have definitions of significant and controversial which we, we don't know which those are and what those are likely to be. We're being asked specifically to take this on the basis that the ministerial code, which we haven't seen to be amended, what it's going to look like, will be amended. We've been asked to accept this on the fact that we need to put some balance and trust on the words of significant and controversial. We see what the words cross-cutting are, but that is, you know, cross-cutting is good, but when are we going to see the rest of the detail? The reason why the Ulster Unionist Party has put us in this amendment is because we want to see the legislation that goes through specifically based around dealing with these issues of Buick on planning. This legislation, as it is being put through at the moment, does not do that. And it is about, members of this Assembly, making sure that we have got the appropriate checks, balances and controls. And we've heard a lot about St Andrews, we've heard a lot about the Belfast Agreement. But one of the reasons why Northern Ireland is, to use the words of the soon-to-be-leaving head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, is seen to be unique, is because the normal checks, balances and controls don't work. And what we have to do is to make sure when we're doing the legislative process that we have good legislation that comes through that addresses the specific issue. 
And the specific issue, Mr Deputy Speaker and members of this Assembly, is how can we ensure that proper planning decisions are made in an appropriate time, not moving away from the position where we are at the moment and not taking away checks, balances and controls. I could speak for much longer, and I'm glad you probably think I'm not going to. I could talk about, and I must admit I really enjoyed the Democratic Unionist Party's history lesson, and thank you very much indeed, and that will be used very much in the future for people to look at this. But this is not an issue about people from outside of here. This is about an issue about making sure we have good legislation, we have openness and transparency, and members of this House, I commend the amendments to you. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Principal Speaker. Members, amendment proposed to clause 1, page 1, line 11, leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshal list. Before putting the, the question on Amendment 1, I'd like to remind members that Amendment 1 is a paving amendment for Amendments 2 and 3. The question is that Amendment 1 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary no. No. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary no. No. I think the ayes have it. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put again in three minutes. And I'd remind you that we should continue, order members, I'd remind you we should continue to hold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come into the chamber. Order members, would members resume their seat, please? 
Before I put the question, I would again remind members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we did not uh, have a division. Um, the question is that the amendment standing in the name of Doug Beatty be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. no. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. no. Do we have tellers? Order members, the following tellers have been appointed tellers for the eyes, Steve Aiken and Jim Wells, tellers for the nose, Gary Middleton and Sinead Innes. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. It's important that during any division that social distancing in the chamber continues to be observed. In order to facilitate this, I would ask the following. Any member in the chamber who are not due to vote in person should consider leaving the chamber until the division has concluded. Those members who wish to vote in the lobbies in the opposite side of the chamber to, the, to which they are sitting should leave the chamber via the nearest door and enter the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby door should enter the lobbies first. Any member who has voted may then wish to leave the chamber until the division has concluded. However, any member who needs to vote in both lobbies should not leave the chamber. I remind members of the need to be patient at all times, to follow the instructions of the lobby clerks, and to respect the need for social distancing. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Order members, would members resume their seats? Order members. Clerk, please read the result. 83 members voted, 10 members voted aye, 73 members vo voted no. The amendment is not made. The amendment is not made. The amendment is not made. Unfasten the doors. Uh, and I'll just uh, ask member to take a few moments to allow other members who wish to, may wish to return to the chamber. Amendment 2 has already been debated, and I call Mr Doug Beatty to move formally Amendment number 2. It's moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 1, page 1, leave out lines 20 to line 2 on page 2 as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 2 be made. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary, no. no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. Aye. <laughs> order, order. I have been advised by party whips in accordance with standing order 113 part 5b there is agreement that we can dispense with the three minutes and move straight to the division so I now call for tellers do we have tellers have been appointed. Tellers for the eyes, Steve Aiken and Jim Wells. Tellers for the nose, Gary Middleton and Sinead Innes. Before the Assembly divides, I again ask that any member in the Chamber who are not due to vote in person should consider leaving the Chamber until the division has concluded. Those members who wish to vote in the lobbies in the opposite side of the Chamber to which they are sitting should leave the Chamber via the nearest door and enter the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby door should enter the lobbies first. And any member who has voted may then wish to leave the chamber until the division has concluded. I remind members of the need to be patient at all times, to follow the instructions of the lobby clerks, and to respect the need for social distancing whilst voting. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Order members, would members resume their seat, please? Clark, please read the result. 83 members voted, 10 members voted aye, 73 members voted no. Amendment 2 is not made. Amendment 2 is not made. Amendment 2 is not made. I will not call Amendment 3 as it is consequential to Amendment 2, which has not been made. That concludes the further consideration stage of the Executive Committee Functions Bill. The bill stands referred to the Speaker. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments before the next item of business, the urgent oral question to the Minister of Health.